beetle. See the trap? You see the traps? Everybody see what I mean? Works good at the front end, bad at the back end. Helps at the beginning, destroys at the back end. That's the problem with drugs. They work too good for some people, but then they trap you because without the drug, you cannot feel okay. Am I making sense? Does this apply to you? Kelly? Sadie? All right. Now, the, the fourth cause of craving you guys are experts on. One of the most remarkable things about people who get addicted is they are very sensitive to stress. They get upset, they need to use. They get down, they need to use. They get angry, pissed off, lonely, they need to use. They get overtired, they need to use. Addiction is one of the most stress sensitive conditions known to medicine. You can't, if you're an addict, you can't get upset without wanting to use. And if you look at this, we know the environment makes you want to use withdrawal. Once you're addicted, to be upset is to need to use. That's why we, that says stress equals craving. Addicted people don't get to be stressed. They get to be hungry to use. <laughs> so built into, especially tobacco, ooh, boy, once you're addicted to tobacco, you are very stress sensitive because it relieves stress just like that. And then if you don't smoke, how's the stress? It's worse. So you smoked, it's what a relief. Then you didn't smoke. Guys see the trap? It's horrible. I know. Deeper every time, every time. It's deeper, deeper, deeper. So whenever you guys are thinking about not using, before you do that, you need to make sure that you consider in your environment who's using, whether you can manage how you're going to feel when you stop and get past it, whether or not you're going to fall into a depression or start having panic attacks or something. Or if you get stressed, I don't care, you're going to rush for your drug. You're going to, because when you get upset, this disease, the craving monster can't stand being stressed. And if you get stressed, the craving monster is going to jump up and down, start screaming, and make you go get some drugs. You will dance to the craving monster's tune, I guarantee you. Afterwards, you know, you'll say, God, I had to, I was so upset I couldn't function. You get the point. Okay, why don't we take a, well, I guess we have a couple more, so I'm going to take a break. Uh, for a couple of minutes, but let me just finish these few slides. Question comes up. Let me give you some numbers first. In America, 94 out of 100 people try things that are known to cause addiction. In America, almost everybody is at risk for becoming addicted because almost everybody, at some point, usually it's adolescence, you know, teenage years, but everybody tries something tobacco, weed, something. If you follow that group of people, 94 out of 100, all of whom try a substance that can lead to addiction, if you follow that group, what you'll see is that only about one in five of them ends up addicted. So everybody tries it, but only one in five gets the disease. Is that just bad luck? Or is there something about the people who get addicted compared to the ones who don't? Let me answer the question. There are definitely very obvious, obvious reasons why some people get addicted and others don't. And one of the things that if you're going to be teachers to other people to explain to them what addiction means, everybody needs to know whether or not they're one of the people who's going to get it if you do it. That's critical. How do you know if you can get it or not? Well, if you look, everybody who tries to drug if they do the drug right, they like it. Like, ooh, this feels good. The next time they do it, let's say, let's say that you're a shy girl and you, know, you don't know a bunch of people get invited to a party and you're kind of shy. Someone gives you, say, a drink and your shyness goes away. Right? That's what, that'll happen, right? If, you, if you're shy, you go to a party, have a drink, you're not shy anymore, you're the life of the party, you're giggling and stuff. 
What are you going to do the next time you go to a party? You're going to want to find it. You're going to look for the person who has something to drink so that you can relax. Now something happens between wanting it and needing it. Danielle, what happened? Um, just want to even need it. Just to... Why? What happened? Nick, what happened? You get tolerant. Once you're tolerant, you need it. You are depending on it. You can't function without it. So the magic line between wanting it and needing it is when you get tolerant. Because now, there's, in addition to liking it, there's something else pushing you. What is it? The way you feel when you stop. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. The saddest thing is, you eventually reach a point where you can't go to a party. You wouldn't even think of going to a party unless you got something to drink first. You require it to function. You're completely dependent. So this is the magic line. Now, if I was watching somebody, we would see they're getting more and more out of control with their use. Used to be she'd go to a party, and, you know, she'd have a beer. You know, three months later, you know, she's packing away a sixer. Um, her use is getting more and more out of control. What we now know is if we could measure it, every time she went sober, she'd go to the party, how would she feel at the party? Bored. Bored. God, these people are jerks. God, I hate being around parties when I'm not partying. <laughs> these people are so stupid, I need to get stupid too. So you get out of control, and when you're sober, you feel worse and worse and worse. This is a trap. This is the trap we're talking about. So here's a question that we're going to look at before we take our break. Everybody who gets addicted had to overuse drugs first. Is that clear? If the, to get the disease, you had to overdo it to injure your brain chemistry. So everybody who's an addict was first a substance abuser. And that meant, usually for alcohol, that means they drank more than three out of seven days. They smoke more out th than three out of seven days. They use. So at that point, they're called a substance abuser. <coughs> so they've, they've gone beyond just sitting around having a beer, sitting around smoking a bowl. They're really using large amounts. And they're getting pretty intoxicated. Now, we know that they turn the corner into addiction when they get tolerant. They need more to get high than they used to. And you said it a minute ago just right. They're bored when they don't use. It's exactly right. They're aware of it too. They know it. <coughs> so for a substance abuser, they need to understand what they're headed for. <coughs> we need to help them understand and motivate them to stop. Once you're an addict, <coughs> you can't stop unless you get help. Here's a news flash. The help that we can give now to people with addiction really, really helps. It used to be it wasn't so great. The treatment was kind of hit or miss. It's not that way anymore. If you came in, say, coming off of Oxy or alcohol or tobacco, you'd be a miserable person. The very first thing I would do would be to treat your misery. And I can do it for any drug now. Oxy, alcohol, weed, meth, any drug makes you feel horrible when you stop. And that horrible feeling makes you want to go back to using. We can now treat that in virtually every drug. No one needs to suffer anymore. I'll go further than that. If you look at oxy, alcohol, tranquilizers, sleeping pills, somas, every single time you go through withdrawal, the next time it will be worse. And if you go through withdrawal then, the next time will be worse. Withdrawal is an injury to your nervous system. The effect of going through withdrawal is your nervous system gets sensitized. And the effect of being sensitized is that withdrawals get worse and worse and worse. It was the worst, for, first couple times you ever went through withdrawal. Was it a big deal? <coughs> is it better, the same, or worse after more withdrawals? So you have an idea of where it's going to be. Probably in the beginning, 
it's not so hard because you're not like you don't need as much because you just started. But then later on down the road, you need more and more, so it gets way harder. And then what happens when you stop? Is what you're, have you, have, here's the question. <clears throat> Scientifically, we know that withdrawals make withdrawals worse. Have you seen it? That's the question. If you've seen it, you're just saying what science knows. I mean, most addicts have figured this out. Uh, the first few times they stop, no big deal. But unfortunately, if they go through that withdrawal without help, without medicine, they're actually injuring themselves. So that the next time they stop, it'll be so much worse. And after that, it'll be much worse. Eventually, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, you, you know people who, who refuse to stop. They just can't stop. They won't stop because they can't go through it again. They won't go through it again. To me, to me, that's very sad because we can prevent sickness now. And I know kids all over the place who won't stop, can't stop, because they're not going to go through that again. Have you heard people talk about that? I have. It's so sad because they don't have to go through it. Shame on us for not allowing people to get treatment for withdrawal. Because if withdrawal is bad enough, you'll use it. And we can stop it cold. So I get angry when I know it doesn't happen. This is a picture of tolerance. And on this slide, I've outlined the way tobacco works. So it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, tobacco smokers wake up. What's the first thing I think about? Cigarette. 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 So you have that first cigarette. You know how you hear your ear, the blood rush in your ears? Whoo! The first cigarette, the first cigarette and a half, is actually the only time in the day you really get high. Because <laughs> if you look, notice that the first couple, notice that the first few times above this gray line, you get high. Okay, so you get high, and then the next cigarette you get high, and notice you're not getting so high, so that by noon, if you don't, you're hardly getting high at all. But if you don't keep smoking, what happens? You go into withdrawal. The only time you feel okay is when your nicotine levels are in the gray zone. So to be above the gray zone, you get high. When you go below the gray zone, you go into nicotine withdrawal. Tobacco smokers go into nicotine withdrawal about once an hour. Uh, and the only time they actually get relief is right after they smoke. Now in the morning, you still get the buzz, you still get alert, you still get calm. But by the middle of the day, it didn't do anything for you. Why do you keep smoking? It calms you. Because it calms you. Because if you keep going, what, you're not getting high, but if you don't keep smoking, what happens? Then you start freaking out. You start freaking out. So after you get high in the morning, you spend the rest of the day preventing yourself from feeling bad. What a crappy drug. It doesn't even make you that high. And you spend all day getting out of withdrawal from it. What a cheap drug. Everybody understand this? So above the line, you get pleasure, alertness. As long as your nicotine levels are in there, you're okay. But as soon as it falls too low, you have to you go into withdrawal. And you now get the hunger and you have to use. So you, tobacco smokers spend all day after the first few cigarettes in the morning treating nicotine withdrawal. Before our break, just some numbers about tobacco. If you look at America, three out of four people try a cigarette at least once. Those are called people who ever smoked. Now, of people who ever smoked, about half of them will become daily smokers. Of people who become daily smokers, one in four of them will be totally addicted. If you take people who become daily smokers and people who are addicted, half of them will die of tobacco. It's one of the most fatal addictions. Kills about half the people who get it. So this is a bad disease. It's the most common cause of preventable death in the world. Uh, it used to be just in America, but the tobacco companies are now selling tobacco all over the world. And it's the fastest rising addiction in the world. It's the most fast rising cause of death in the world. 
So of people who try a cigarette, about half of them will, will die from tobacco. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Good question. I'm not sure I know the answer, but it's true. Female smokers get sick sooner, they get worse sickness, and they die more soon than male smokers do. It's true with other drugs, too, that there are differences between males and females and who gets the worst case. But women shouldn't smoke because they're far more likely to be unable to get off. If you look at treatment of addiction for tobacco in men and women, women do much less well. Now that's not to say that we can't do it now, now that we know the reasons for relapse. Okay, Daniel, okay, Nick, you tell me. Let's suppose someone's a nicotine smoker and they want to stop. That's because, let's say they went to the doctor and the doctor did an x-ray and saw something on their lungs and God, maybe it's cancer. That person needs to stop, right? We know there are four things that will make him keep smoking. Being around it, withdrawal from it, a mental health problem like boredom or depression or anxiety, or getting stressed out. How would you help them? Give them a cigarette. <laughs> How about if you wanted to help them not die? Anybody, what would you do? Not smoke around them. You wouldn't smoke around them. Good for you, man. That is an A+. Plus. The nicest thing, no, wait a minute, the nicest thing, wait a minute, the nicest thing you can do to somebody trying to stop, don't use around them. I mean, that's kindness. I'll give you a hint. You can tell a real friend. You know a true friend. A true friend wouldn't hurt you. And if someone is, you're trying to stop, and someone's offering you their drugs, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care what you say, that is not a friend. I don't, that's not a friend. That's what we call a drug friend. <laughs> and they're not the same as friend friends. The real friend wouldn't hurt you. So if you want to know who your friends are, in one question you say, would you please not smoke around me? I'm trying to stop. And someone who cares about you, loves you, honors you, holds you in their heart, they won't smoke around you. They're trying to help you. Someone who doesn't have that value of you, they could care less. They will hurt you. Because the main reason why you won't stop smoking is they're puffing on it in front of you. So you can sort your friends right away. <laughs> That's a good answer. I mean, it's a, so the first thing that someone has to do to stop smoking is don't be around smokers. Your parents smoke? Your parents smoke? Kelly? Your parents smoke? Your parents smoke? Your parents smoke? Chances of you getting off tobacco just fell about. 50%. Okay, so um, Nick, I'm your dad. You just got found to have an x-ray with possible cancer. You need to stop smoking, right? Right? I'm your dad. Hi, Nick. How's school? Great. Uh -huh. Yeah. Want a cigarette? Could you get my matches for me, dude? Could you get my matches? Could you get my pack of cigarettes for me, Matt? You can have one. I mean, just take one off the top. Don't tell your mama. Can you get my cigarette? <laughs> what are the chances that he's going to be able to get off tobacco? Very poor. Okay, your life depends on it, Nick. Your life depends upon you not smoking. Got me? Okay, give yeah, me your dad. Hi, Nick. What's up, Dad? Hey, Nick. My cigarette, dude? No, I'm okay. I might have cancer. Big deal. <laughs> We ought to go sometime, dude, you know. I don't think about it myself. What does he need to do? Can you please not smoke around me? That's what he needs to do. Javier got it right. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. It may be the hardest thing you ever do in your life. You need to be able to say, I love you. I care about you. You're my dad. I want to be in a family with you. If you really, really care about me, please don't smoke around me, please, please. And if he loves you, he'll honor that. It won't be easy for him, but if he loves you, he'll understand that, God, he's gonna have to do his part. And that's how you know who your friends are, I swear to God, that's right off the bat, you will know who's gonna help you and who isn't gonna help you. That is exactly the right answer. You got it. Want a job? 
<laughs> we have a counselor in my office. All right, why don't we take a break? <clears throat> and <clears throat> when we come back, I want to teach you guys how to tell where you are in the process. There's a very simple experiment that we can teach you to do. And if you're going to be teachers of other people, because I'm asking you to be teachers of other people whom you know, you need to know how to teach them to do an experiment that will tell them if they're addicts or not. Okay? All right, copy. <clears throat> okay, what I want to do is start this section with, uh, by introducing you to somebody who has serious addiction, who's late in the game, who has really had what we call adverse consequences. Um, and uh, she's going to summarize basically some of the principles. Now, as she's speaking, I want you to look at why she kept relapsing. What are the four causes of craving? What are the four letters that? EWMS, exactly right. The environment, withdrawal, your mental health status, and stressors. So Allison is going to discuss briefly her addiction. And she, while she's talking, I want you to listen to the factors that got... Okay, here's how I think about it. There's two things I want you to leave with today. One is what gets people addicted and what keeps them addicted. What gets them addicted is called the BIPSM, B-P-S-M, the biopsychosocial model. I'm going to teach you that now. What keeps a person addicted is the things that bring on craving. So once you've got the disease, the disease persists because of the environment, because you can't get past withdrawal, because when you stop you get blue or anxious or anxious or whatever, or you're doing okay and you get completely stressed out. Uh, so as she talks about her addiction briefly, I want you to kind of look at it, because here, here's the task that I'm giving you. I want you guys, when you listen to her, and when you listen to this next section, I want you to assume for a minute that you're teachers. And you're teaching your friends, your, your closest friends, about what you learned today in terms of what the disease is, why, how you get it, how you know you got it. So I want, you guys are going to be my teachers. And at the end of the day, go find somebody and teach them. Okay? That's just the, 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 the mindset that I want you to have. So Allison, come tell us about addiction, girl. Um, Allison is somebody I've known for a couple years. She uh, is a drug addict. Um, she makes you guys look like Mary Poppins. Uh, <laughs> and she is sober. All right, this is Allison. Allison, sit down. Hello. Well, I've never done anything like this before, but I was so impressed that you guys were all here today and your questions. And I just, if I could have heard what you guys have been able to hear so far today, I would have done anything at your age because like I guarantee like this is just the beginning and it gets so much worse and I've really had to go through that to find it out and people told me so much when I was younger if I could just get it at your age and it sounds so crazy at the time and at the time I couldn't believe it you're gonna save yourself so much pain and all of these things he's telling you, I know it's really hard to believe because it's statistics and it's on a PowerPoint and all this stuff. But I'm telling you firsthand that those things will happen to you. They happen to drug addicts. And it's very real. Give me a and for instance. It doesn't go away. How old were you when you started? I started smoking weed when I was about 12 years old. How long before you got tolerant to it? Um, um, probably within the first week, okay. I started smoking weed every single day. Okay, Kelly, why do we want to know when she got tolerant? What's the question we're asking? When did the disease start, right? Because the first sign that the disease is set in is when you get tolerant, right? Yeah, did it, did yeah. you have to start using more? Let me add in at the beginning, I've, I have ADD, um, I have anxiety and depression, and that's something that I carried with me through my childhood that I couldn't really relate to and I didn't really know what it was. 
I knew that I wasn't happy and I knew that I didn't feel like most kids did, but I couldn't identify what it was that didn't make me feel like everybody else. What's your point? So, What's that have to do with drugs? So that is what basically made me more prone to the disease. I started off not at the normal rate and I went to go find drugs that made me feel better. Not which helped the problems that I had uh, with my with my anxiety, my depression, my ADD temporarily, but in the long run, they obviously made it a lot worse. And when I tried, Did you guys to stop, hear what she said? She said when she first started using it, the anxiety and the ADD were improved. That's what a lot of people, when they first start using drugs, experience. They don't like the way they feel. She didn't know she had anxiety and depression. No one told her. She just she didn't feel like other kids did. But when she started using drugs, she found that those symptoms were much less. So basically... Now, wait a minute. After you found that it helped, what happened when you tried to stop once you got tolerant? I felt much worse than I ever did in the beginning. And at that point, I had ruined so many relationships and caused so much trouble by lying and um, treating the people that I cared about the most and the people that were trying to help me so badly that I had almost dug myself into a much okay, bigger the, the second sign that we know, so first is you can't control or use. The second sign, what's the second sign we know someone's addicted? Kudak. So what she just c continued to use despite adverse consequences. What she just described is a whole pile of adverse consequences. She burned out her relationships with her family, her friends, her school. She got, she went down the tubes. So the adverse consequences really piled up. Did the adverse consequences stop you from using? No. No. Did they backfire and make you use more? Yes. That's the problem. Stress equals craving. So as she got more and more upset in more and more trouble, instead of the trouble helping her stop, it freaked her out and made her use more. Yes. So the problem for addicts is you can punish them and punish them, it backfires, it makes them want to use more. And the thing that's so different about this disease is that so many people are so uneducated about it and it's so hard because people look at this as a personality, you know, a failure, that you don't care about anyone, that you're not strong enough, that you don't have the willpower. And really, if I had cancer, let's say, and went into the hospital for chemo, rather than alcohol poisoning, I'd have flowers all by my bed. And people would be sympathetic and understanding, and they would be there to help me. But people were so unable to understand it, especially my family, because there, as far as I know, there isn't much addiction in my family that I know of. They were so, they weren't able to understand it. Okay, well, so. let, let's interrupt you there because I think she inter introduced our next topic. Let me just start from there. Thank you. What she just said is that. What she just said is. That's it. What she just. What she just said is there's not a lot of addiction in her family. She also said that she had had problems with depression and anxiety and a diagnosis of ADD, and yet without. And so somehow or another, the notion here is that something about her background made her more at risk for getting addicted. If we go all the way back to the very first slide, to the pleasure scale, she was born with ADD. ADD means you're born bored. Any of you have been given a diagnosis of ADD? Uh, people with a family history are born bored. There's two reasons why a bored kid gets into trouble with drugs. Who can tell me what they are? Here's Allison. She's 11. She's bored. Someone gives her a joint. What's different about Allison than somebody else? Here's the normie. Here's the bored kid. They both get offered a joint. What's the difference in how they feel? Nick? One has ADD and the other one doesn't? Yeah, and? 
Can you guys see? Yeah. Starts out lower on the scale already than the other one does. So when she uses, they both get high, but this one gets on board. One of the first ways we know someone has the gene for addiction, inherited the risk for addiction, is it takes them more to get high. You know those people who say, I'm not an alcoholic, I can drink you under the table, I'm the last man standing, you know, I can really hold my liquor. Too bad. Because <laughs> that means that their pleasure system needs more to get going. So we can often tell when people first start. You know those guys who you, you, you're gathering around the bowl, the guy who does two-thirds of the bowl and everybody barely gets a hit? That's the one who's got the gene for addiction. <laughs> Takes him much, much more to get high uh, than it does the other people. So the first reason why Allison would get in trouble compared to the normie, Allison took more to get high, but they both got high. But in addition to getting high, she got on board. She also said she had depression. Well, if this was a depression scale instead of a ple pleasure scale, she would be depressed. And when she used, compared to a normie, she gets undepressed. Can you see she's gonna like it more? You see that? Okay, Danielle, what happens when both of them stop? No, Kelly, you got the answer right off the top. What happens when both of them stop? She started lower than this one. She goes lower. She goes still lower. They both go lower. She drops faster than normal. Yes, she does. So the normie gets bored. The kid who was bored to begin with gets dysphoric. As bad as you can feel. Do you see what's happening here? So if this was anxiety compared to a normie, the normie gets high, the anxious kid gets high, but the anxious kid gets unanxious. Here's the tragedy, it's so sad. That original symptom always comes back worse. It always comes back worse, which means you are now trapped. That's, that's what I was trying to explain this morning. With me? So she said several things that I want to revisit. Uh, here we go. Now, you're my teachers. You're going to go find a friend of yours, and you're going to teach them about addiction. And you're going to tell them addictions where you can't control yourself. Even though it's causing you trouble, you still can't control yourself. But when you try and stop using, you get hungry for the drug. And if you get hungry enough, it'll blank out your brain and you'll do it. That's the disease. We know that the disease starts because you use so much that it made your pleasure center go deaf. And to try and hear, your brain says, give me more, give me more, give me more. That's all clear to you, right? Just before the break, first question is, how many of you smoked over lunch? All of you. Uh huh. So after a great discussion of how many people are going to die on tobacco, <laughs> I managed to stimulate a bunch of cigarette smoking. <laughs> now, of the, of the four causes of craving, environment, withdrawal, mental health, and stress, which of those four things made you go out and smoke? Withdrawal. And it's stressful going through what you're going through. And, you know, I've given this talk to <coughs> cancer patients. And in the break, they're rushing out in clouds of smoke arising over their heads. You know, and here they have cancer. So the first question you need to know is, are you one of the one out of five who can't use drugs? Everybody tries drugs. Only one in five get nailed. Are you one of the one in, one in five? Well, there's now a good way of determining if you're one of the one in five that can't stop. It's called a BIPSM. B-P-S-M. Say it. B-P-S-M. Stands for biopsychosocial model. What it means is some of the reasons why some people get addicted are biologic, the way their body was put together. Some of it is their psychology, if they're depressed or anxious. Some of it is if they're around smokers, using it, their social environment. So you put all these together and you can decide whether or not the person you're teaching or you or somebody else is at risk for getting the disease. Now once you get the disease, humus keeps it going. The environment, withdrawal symptoms, your mental health picture, and the stresses, just like lunch. 
So this is pretty much everything you need to know about addiction, once you know what it is. I want to see if we can figure out why some people get addicted and others don't. So this is an example of what's called the BIPSOM, the biopsychosocial model. The idea is, is that most people who get the disease have a risk factor. That's what's meant by predisposition or something about them that's different than other people. And that difference responds to drugs. That difference is fixed by drugs. That difference, that predisposition, is something that makes drugs work too well for them. They like drugs more than other people because of a risk factor. Of all the risk factors in the world, seven out of 10 addicts have one risk factor in common. What is it? What's the most common reason why someone gets addicted but other people don't? That's the answer. This is an inherited disease. This is like diabetes. You know diabetes runs in families, right? Pretty much similar to this one. Most people get addicted because of they inherited the predisposition. And we know that you get predispositions through the genes. So the question is, what does the gene give you? How do we know if someone has the gene? What does the gene make you feel like that makes drugs work too well? You with me so far? The question we're asking is, if you inherited a gene, why does that gene make you like drugs too much? Is that question clear? So the number one risk factor, and this accounts for about 70% of people who get the disease, have a family history, people in their parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, who have the disease. The more people in your background with the disease, the more people with bad disease, the more likely you're going to get it, and you're going to get it bad. Don't you wish somebody would have told you that? I do too. Now, the second most common reason, I'm not going to discuss this today, but I want to give you this information. The second most common reason why people get addicted, men and women, is because somebody molested them when they were little. And we know that if a kid has sexual contact 